Hi, I'm Greg. And I'm Leanne. Welcome to Empowered Now. Where we save humanity one one relationship relationship at a time. time. We all struggle from time to time connecting with and understanding others and ourselves. So we hope to encourage you to live a more authentic and empowered life by sharing what we've learned as coaches and as individuals. Empowered Now is LGBTQ2IA alternative lifestyle, poly and kink friendly. Thanks for joining us and And enjoy enjoy the the show. Hi, and welcome to episode five, where we will be discussing long-term relationship challenges. This idea came to us from our Facebook group, Empowered Now, Relationship Support and Advice for All. And we took a poll with our uh, group members and they asked for this. So this is why we're doing it. Right, honey? Right. Yep. Yep. You ask and you shall receive. (laughs) Uh, And so you and I, between us, have several long-term relationships. A lot of long-term relationships, yes. We have, between us, we have um, uh, eight marriages. But yeah, In- a lot of, yeah. Including this one, so really including, seven. Including this one, yeah, seven. Yeah. Seven, um, it's funny you say that because I'll start off by saying that I was just working with a client earlier today and I brought up the fact that that I had been married three times, married four times and divorced three. And I've had a couple of other clients actually say, well, you know, why are you a relationship coach? And my response to that is, well, who better than somebody who's tried it, you know, at least three times and, and, and I won't say failed because I used to look at it as a failure, but, and learn from it. Right. Um, Oftentimes we stay in long-term relationships because either we feel that we don't have a choice or we feel that we're not worthy of something better or something more in alignment with who we are. Um, so we just end up staying and living with it. And she even brought up the fact that it's like, you know, um, you know, it may not be that bad, but, you know, so I guess I'll just live with it, right? Well, the reality is, is that you're miserable in it. So leaving is obviously one way to fix it, but that's not really what we're going to talk about primarily. We're going to talk about, you know, sort of other things that you can do to help fix the relationship, right? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yes. And, you know, obviously we or our partners up until this relationship have chosen to end things. And like you said, that's one way to solve the discomfort that we're feeling while we're in that relationship. However, there are other things that we can try first. And, you know, certainly once you have exhausted a list of things that, you know, you've brought to the relationship in order to help it, um, to enrich it, and it still is suffering, somebody has to (laughs) make the call. Somebody has to say, and we're done. Right. Right. Exactly. And or or not, or you can continue to live in that disconnect, right? And that misalignment, right. And and I think that's fairly common too. So I think uh, one of the things that we should talk about are what are the relationship challenges that happen when you're with each other for a long time, and this can be with one or multiple partners if you're poly, and uh, you know the same things apply, don't they? Right, exactly. And this also applies across relationships too, like other relationships as well. But I think specifically what we're talking about here is your intimate, like your intimate connections, your intimate relationships, right? Um, The first thing is funny because when we were compiling the list the other day, the first thing that came to mind was boredom. Um, (laughs) That was the first thing that came right out of your mouth, boredom. I know, I didn't even have to think about it. I was like, boredom. Um, which is interesting. I mean, it's, it's, and I think it's, I think it came out so quickly because it's, it's where I've been in previous relationships. It's where sure. I sort of end up, right? We get complacent, we get bored. You know, we, we stop making the effort. We stop putting in the work, um, you know, yep. uh, and by we, I mean myself in this case. Um, and then in a lot of cases with other partners, um, I felt that maybe they weren't putting in the work as well. So what what came up for you when we were talking about it um well i think the first thing that came into my head was similar to boredom and is sort of the cause of the boredom but being in a rut where (laughs) you are day in day out doing the same things together life doesn't change much there's not much excitement in the actual 
relationship itself or new information being introduced you know after a few years you've <laughs> you've heard each other's stories you know each other's histories um it's hard to find those things that kind of you know excite you about your partner again that get you interested in in them and and exploring them because you know there's a lot of exploration at the very beginning and then there's not <laughs> mm -hmm. then there's a lot of like oh i know this person very well um i can predict a lot of their uh behaviors i can kind of predict how my week is going to look and and that kind of feeds into the boredom right and that's the the root cause the lack of new information the lack of exploration the lack of experimentation mm -hmm. so yeah yeah i completely agree it, it's interesting because as you were saying that too one thing that came up for me was is even as we're going through this quarantine you and i are spending uh, just about every day like literally every single day together in the same house um but i don't find myself being bored around you and i'm not saying this to 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 espouse the wonders of you because you are you're an incredibly wow. amazing human being and i'm incredibly blessed to have you but for me one of the reasons for that is just because i am i'm a communicator like that's at the top of my list of of relationship needs and it took yes. me a long fucking time to realize that um but it is definitely at the top of the list of relationship needs for me so sitting down and communicating with you and and and, and i don't mean talking about the weather or the food that we're eating or anything else but i'm i mean really sitting down and talking about things you know that come up for us right how are you feeling today and not just, oh, I feel okay, you know, da, 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 right? But I mean, like, really, what's coming up for you, mm -hmm. right? And putting those feelings on the table. For me, that's exciting in a way. It's, it's interesting. It, it, keeps it, it keeps it fresh for me because I learn about you every, every time we have those conversations, right? Um, yeah. You know, and so I think that's one of the ways that you can keep from falling into that rut is, is, is having the communication piece there, right? And then you mentioned exploring and experimenting. I think those are two things too. You know, like you said, I mean, you, you, you kind of start doing the same old thing over and over and over again. And there's comfort in that. Absolutely. I was just going to say that. <laughs> there's a lot of comfort in that. There's a lot of comfort in routine. I mean, we are by nature yeah. as human beings, we are creatures of, of habit and creatures of routine. So we, we live comfortably within that routine. But when, when the nagging little thoughts in the back of your head start to come up about why am I no longer happy or what disconnect is happening in my relationship or how is my relationship starting to fracture, right? When those questions start to come up, mm -hmm. right? This is the investigative stuff that needs to be done, in my opinion anyway, to start to really sort of, okay, so what's the first thing that I need here? Right. We talked about journaling earlier. Right. Mm -hmm. Journaling is a great way to get clarity around what your needs are and what your values are and why you've chosen to be in the relationship that you're in and, you know, et cetera, or the relationships that you're in, depending upon how you align. Yes. And that's that is exactly what I think the first step to addressing any challenge in a relationship is, is acknowledging the problem. We were talking about that mm -hmm. as well. Um, acknowledging the problem is the first step to any kind of recovery or treatment. So that applies here too. And journaling is a great way in, mm -hmm. especially if you have a private journal that you can just kind of let your thoughts flow. And if you're not used to journaling or that's maybe not, you know, something you're comfortable with, you could try recording your thoughts mm -hmm. on your phone, right? I used right. to do that walking the dog, just stick my recorder on and, and kind of journal to the phone, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think that's a really important part of of addressing what's going on is knowing where you're coming from first. Right. And then once you've got that clarity or at least some clarity around it, then you can present that to your partner and mm -hmm. say, hey, look, this is where I'm coming from. These is what feelings I'm having right now. Mm. You know, and then what are you feeling? Right. And so that's the first, like you said, the first step is acknowledgement. The second step, I think, is is communicating what you've discovered about yourself and your needs and your wants. And, and getting curious about your partner's needs and wants. Exactly. And then getting curious about what they want and what they need, right? Um, 
it's interesting because one thing that comes up for me here, and this is something that was, this is something that came up for me a lot in my previous relationships. Um, and I think I didn't know about attachment styles then, but I do now. Now that I have a really good understanding of my attachment style, I can see why I started to disconnect from people. Um, but mm -hmm. one of the things that was interesting to me was, is I started to see my partners as enemies, as people who were out to get me, right? As to do me mm -hmm. harm as it were, right? And the more I started to open up about my attachment style, which by the way is fearful avoidance, um, I really started to understand that, that when it came to intimacy and love and, and stuff, I didn't have a whole lot of trust around it, no matter who I was with. So at a certain point, my limiting beliefs started to, to interpret intimacy and connection as being a threat to me. And then by extension, I started to interpret my partners as being a threat to me, mm -hmm. being the enemy. But the interesting thing was, is that once I started to finally open that up and say, hey, this is how I'm feeling. I got vulnerable with those feelings. And I said, hey, look, this is how I'm feeling. Um, I realized that they were just doing the best that they could with the tools that they had too. So they weren't necessarily my enemy. They weren't trying out to get me or hurt me in some way. Maybe I needed to do a more effective job at creating safe spaces for myself and those around me, which is where mm -hmm. I came up with that idea of, you know, the idea of personal responsibility and all of that stuff, right? Absolutely. So it plays a huge role in how we present this information once we've journaled it. I know I kind of digressed a little bit, but I think it presents a, I think it, it's an opportunity for us to present that in a way, getting curious and saying, hey, look, this is what's coming up for me. I want to hear what's coming up for you. And in, in that non-adversarial kind of approach, exactly. hopefully, right? Non-blaming. Yeah, no, no blame. No blame, no shame. And, and the idea of, you know, presenting what I'm feeling in a way that doesn't relinquish my responsibility for those feelings or put those feelings and the responsibility for them onto my partner or partners, right? So I wouldn't want to come into this conversation and say, I'm feeling neglected because you never pay attention to me, right? right? That's not how to What's your, have this but conversation. It's, but it's interesting because what, what, what immediately comes up for me is, is, well, yeah, I do. I mean, I give you a kiss every day. I talk to you every day. I do this, right? I do that. You know, I do the dishes. I do this, I, you know, whatever it is, right? So immediately you present, I, I get defensive, even though I know you're not talking to me. I'm still feeling like, what the fuck, man? Like I get defensive, <laughs> even right. just in an example scenario of that. Yeah, this, imagine, this isn't real. <laughs> no, but imagine, imagine what the real world would feel like if you presented that information to somebody. Mm -hmm. And then also put yourself in their shoes. What would it feel like if somebody presented that information to you that way? So a better way might be to say, uh, you actually phrase it as the story I'm telling myself is mm -hmm. yeah, that, I got that you don't want to pay attention to me. Go ahead. You yeah, I got that say? from Brene Brown, actually. The, the story I'm telling myself is something I learned from Brene Brown. Love it. Yeah, it's very applicable and useful. So the story I'm telling myself is that you don't want to spend time with me. And that's because I'm unlovable. Um, so that's a story. And when I, when I hear that coming from you uh, or something like that, when you say it's a story I'm telling myself, then I can see it as a story. I, I don't see it as a, a, an accusation. I don't see it as a truth. I see it as you're creating this narrative around the emotional reaction that you're experiencing right to explain you, it yeah you like to use the terms prescriptive and descriptive mm -hmm. and i think that applies here too right one way of saying it is you're doing this to me is prescribing you know you're, you're prescribing behaviors of somebody else and how they're making you quote unquote feel the other one is you're describing how you feel based upon your experiences right so for me right is it also allows me to step out of the story that I'm telling myself and look at it from a different perspective too, right? And so it all, it becomes this book that we're both reading now, right? And so the story that I'm telling myself is, is that you um, have stopped caring about our marriage um, because I'm not worthy 
uh, to be your partner anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's no blame in there at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's all about me, really. Right. And which is really useful in opening up dialogue because it prevents or at least mitigates some of the defensiveness that comes up for people. Right. Exactly. And that opens up the opportunity for the other person to say, well, you know, we don't really have a lot of variety in what we're doing these days. I mean, we've been in, you know, multiple lockdowns, it's COVID times, we're <laughs> working from home, like, <laughs> we're stuck in these four walls. So, you know, um, there might be a little boredom and that might be accurate, right? Um, so what can we do then as a team to kind of liven things up in the home front? right or right. in the bedroom or you know have some silly fun i think a lot of times we forget about the the joy of play and goofing around um you know not uh being caught up in our in our devices all day long but connecting with the other person uh so one of the things that you mentioned earlier was creating a safe space mm -hmm. and i think what we're talking about now is a way to help create a safe space using I statements, not shaming, not blaming, not pointing fingers, not using inflammatory language, but to calmly and rationally approach the subject with curiosity. And something that you brought up earlier, willingness, you, uh, before we started this recording, you were saying willingness is huge in this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, both or all parties have to be willing to investigate. They have to be willing to invest in, in the relationship. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one person doing all the work really isn't equitable, right? Um, and I think it also speaks volumes about where you might be disconnected to. Um, if, if one person isn't willing to acknowledge that there's a problem in the relationship, and maybe there isn't a problem for that person in this relationship. Maybe that person's perfectly happy with the way things are. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you're not, then you're not in alignment anymore. Mm -hmm. So then then a different set of decisions need to be made. Right. Well, and I think that's a really important point that, um, you know, for one person, it may, their reality could be completely different than their partners. And it's OK to say, I've been so happy and you're bored. <laughs> like, oh, well, that's too bad. What can we do about that? You know, mm -hmm. um, right. And there is, there is one piece that I just want to kind of address though, with the willingness piece, which is, I, I see a lot of this kind of almost resentment or defensiveness around working on a relationship where people really strive for equity and they say things like, well, if they're not going to put any effort in, I'm not going to put any effort in, mm -hmm. but that leaves you stuck, right? Right. That leaves you at an impasse. Somebody needs to step into that uncomfortable conversation and say, you know, I really want to share some things that have been coming up for me. You mm -hmm. know, are you in a space in a place where you can hear those things? Is this a good time? Or do you want to do it on Saturday when perhaps you're not thinking about work or whatever, right? So I think there is a, a necessary ingredient of willingness, but I don't necessarily think it has to be equal. Right, right. Perfectly well put. Let me ask you a question then. Yeah. So, so what happens, what would you suggest doing then if um, you've done that five, six times over the course of the last 10 years? <laughs> and each time things get better for a few, but then they go right back, sort of that rubber band experience, right? You know, the rubber band snaps, it goes back, everything is Lived fine. <laughs> Yeah, everything is fine. And then it just slowly starts to snap again and, you know, stretch again and until it snaps. What would you suggest somebody do after they've done that five or six times over the course of however long? And I it think it's not. Back? Yeah, I don't I don't think a, there's a number that you can really uh, prescribe. See, there's yeah, the no. prescriptive thing, right? So five right. or six times for one person is nothing. No, That's I'm just zero. using that as an example. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So it might, it, not, it might not be that big a deal to do it for that long, but um, I think people are, are, who are working on a relationship, who are investing and who are seeking help for the things that they need help for <clears throat> in terms of coaching or therapy or whatever, they know, <laughs> they feel 
already like there is kind of a, a, a limit to what they can do moving forward. And that timeline might vary, it might change. I might say to myself internally in my head, okay, well, I'm willing to put a year of counseling into this. Um, and then at that end of that year, kind of reevaluate and go, oh, I think we need another year, <laughs> which is what happened in one of my relationships. So, you know, at the end of that two year period was when I really had had sort of enough. I was, I was at my, my saturation point in terms of willingness to invest and to keep investing without change that is permanent, long lasting, right? So um, yeah, I think, I think there, there is a point where you do have to say, this is enough. We've really tried, or I've really tried. And, you know, it's just not working. It's just a misalignment that's carrying on. Mm -hmm. Or like you said, stay in that misalignment and, and, manage the uncomfortableness, <laughs> which right. is kind of like putting a Band-Aid on a, on a wound that needs some sutures, but you can do it. No, yeah, you can do it. You know, and it'll probably heal and tear open and heal again and tear open and yeah, yep, that happens. happens. Yeah, for sure. Um, some of the other long-term relationship challenges I think that come up are, um, and I suppose it's all related really when you think about it, but um is this idea of feeling trapped mm. you know like i i've heard that from clients before and other people too it's like i want to get out but i don't know how or i want things to change but i don't know how to change them i feel trapped you know mm -hmm. i think that's where you know whatever tools you brought to the table they're not working for you so you need some help you need to reach out to a therapist or a coach and see if they can guide like you us. like us yeah like us like us um shameless plug yeah. <laughs> yeah uh get some help and you know and invest in that for a, a length of time that you're comfortable with and then you know sort of see where that goes i think trapped is that feeling of uh, a real sense of you know no changes no tools and unsure of direction to take right we don't have direction i wonder too if maybe some of the some of what feeling trapped is maybe you don't feel capable of making the changes maybe you don't mm. feel like you deserve to make the changes right maybe you deserve the situation that you're in right you don't deserve better yes. happier more healthy relationships right and so yes. i think that's personal work that's that's internal work that's work that you do on yourself right and that's another component to this as well, is, is that idea that you're working together, but you're also mm -hmm. working separately on yourselves in order to sort of keep the, you know, keep the, the keep both of the pillars of the relationship stable, right? Mm -hmm. Supporting the relationship, right? So if one of those pillars isn't stable, then it falls and leans on the other one, and then it ends up destabilizing the relationship as well. So I think it's important that both people are doing work on themselves as individuals too. In fact, I would say that it's it's equally important that you're doing the individual work on yourself too is in, in conjunction with, you know, therapy or couples therapy or couples work and communication and connection, right? If you're feeling trapped and your ideas behind being trapped are are, you know, I don't, you know, I don't deserve better or I don't feel worthy of a better relationship or I'm too this or I'm not enough that. There's a lot of internal opportunity there for you to, to really unpack some really, really significant stuff. You know, I always like to say that, you know, emotions, emotions are like, um, you know, lights on a dashboard, right? You know, when you see the light go on on the dashboard, you check under the hood and see what needs attending to. Oftentimes, it's not that it needs to be fixed. It might just need to be filled up or maybe maybe the plug's kind of a little disconnected and you need to kind of just plug it in a little bit more or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know? But the reality is, is that if you don't look under the hood, the problem isn't going to go away. The light isn't going to just, and it, sometimes the light might just magically go off. <laughs> but the problem yeah. is still there. Right. So, you know, so I think that's really important to understand is that when you're in a relationship, the relationship with yourself 
has to be tuned into as well. Mm -hmm. So that is so cool that you brought that up because in the book, The Highly Sensitive Person, which you have read and I am now starting, in the very beginning, they talk about the highly sensitive child uh, in a parenting situation being more comfortable the older they get with consistent parenting, whether the parenting is good or bad. Mm -hmm. So what matters to them isn't um, the quality of the parenting. It matters how little it changes. Mm -hmm. So they're resistant to change. And so for highly sensitive people in relationships, there might be some element of that going on too, where their foundational relationships with parents or peers were uh, fraught with, you know, drama, difficulty, maybe um, some abusive behaviors or, you know, um, Abandonment. dismissiveness, that kind of detached kind of parenting or, or friends um, where they're emotionally unavailable. And then that person goes into their intimate relationships seeking that because that's what they're comfortable with but that's not necessarily what's going to help them grow and and be their their you know best selves so that that just came up for me today when i was reading that i got really interested in that research because that made a lot of sense and a lot of my early relationships i did i i did want um, to feel valued, but I also was comfortable with a level of dismissiveness and emotional unavailability, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what I had known. And so I was like, hmm, <laughs> hmm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my experiences growing up were, I mean, I, you know, pretty significant abandonment issues um, where my mother was concerned, especially and then my father did his best, but he wasn't always the most emotionally available or attentive physically person, right? Um, and it's not to blame them, like that's not what I'm trying to say, but what I'm trying to say is, is that it created this idea that, that, that I, I found comfort in consistency more so than being valued and appreciated. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I, I often say about, you know, emotions, just because something is comfortable doesn't mean it's good for us and just because something is uncomfortable doesn't mean it's not good for us ding ding right? ding 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 i think this <laughs> i think this i think this is a perfect example of that but you can get into very comfortable situations that are very unhealthy mm -hmm. and you can get into very healthy situations that are incredibly uncomfortable <laughs> yeah right? like being in a relationship with greg million yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. It is um, a compliment. You know why I say that is because you have, I probably mentioned this before, but you have really modeled for me a lot of fantastic communication skills and vulnerability skills that I didn't really have. And advocating for my needs and things like that, you have encouraged, you fostered that in me as a partner. And I appreciate that so much because I'll tell you what, in my previous relationships, my my first reaction to something was to harbor it, to hold on to it, to maybe score keep a little bit. Okay, so that was a wrong done against me. Okay, that's one, right? And then <laughs> as time progressed, that's two, that's three. Okay, at five, I'm going to say something. <laughs> because then I felt comfortable, like I, I had this sort of arsenal of, of blame that I could bring to a conversation. I wasn't creating a safe space. I was not advocating for my needs. I was not communicating what was going on with me, right? And it's only really in recent years that I have recognized that and done the work and been in a relationship with you where that's actually encouraged and it's really helped me come a long way, I think. And, you know, thank you. I just want to say thank you. I love you. I love you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah. So oh, go ahead. No, I, I think uh, the word receptive comes to mind right now for some reason. That's what's coming up for me right now. I think willingness to be receptive. Mm hmm to some of the, 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 as one of my clients calls it, the icky stuff, right? <laughs> about yourself, right? So, yeah. you know, 
your partner comes to you and says, the story I'm telling myself is X, Y, and Z. And so what's coming up for you might be some defensiveness or might be some insecurities or some, some challenges or some issues. And then that's when we start to get in my, in my growth anyway. And I, mm -hmm. as a recovering asshole, I wasn't always like this. <laughs> but in my growth, what I've come to understand in, in the work that I've done with myself is, is that those, that discomfort, that uneasiness that comes up around that, the defensiveness is trying to tell me something about myself, right? right. right? It's trying to tell me something about myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so the willingness to open up into that and really examine that, right? With your partner or separately or whatever i think is just there's just massive amounts of opportunity in that i mean that's honestly that's something i, I don't i, I want to say i don't believe in regret but i experience regret if that makes any sense um because i think one of the things that i always like to to to, to think about and to share and the reason i'm so passionate about doing the work that we're doing is because i don't want people to be 50 45 years old waking up just realizing this shit, like right. i did <laughs> I want them to realize it earlier in life so that they can have a more fulfill, more fulfilling relationships and deeper intimate connections and, and so on and so forth sooner and experience that for longer amounts of time, right? Um, and so if you can realize sooner rather than later that everything that happens to us, even the most uncomfortable, challenging, difficult, bullshit, fucked up feeling that you might have is still an opportunity. And if you can get curious about those opportunities, I really think there's there's massive amounts of of growth that can happen earlier on. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you're you're not you're not as impacted by other people's discontentment because you don't take it as personally. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Right. So your partner comes to you and says, "I'm feeling X, Y, and Z." you don't, for me, I always used to take that personally immediately and still do sometimes. Like we just had a, a big argument a week or two ago. What? We never argue. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. We I'm going to edit argue. this out. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. But what I'm I saying though, we just had a big argument a few weeks ago and I, to this day, don't remember what started it, but I remember that I got incredibly defensive almost immediately. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I look back on it now, and I didn't see that at first. I didn't see that that's what was coming up for me. I, I saw myself as trying to justify my actions. I saw myself as trying to explain my actions and why I did what I did. When the reality was, is that all I really needed to do was step back and say, okay, I'm feeling defensive right now. And I don't know why. Which you have, you know, successfully done before. Right. right? And so too. that's what I'm. When I say you model those things for me, that's what I'm talking about is that you have done those things before. And yeah, you know, you don't hit it hundred percent all the time and neither do I, right. I got just as angry. So, right. <laughs> you know, we lose our, our composure sometimes we're not perfect, but I think the goal here is to increase articulation about what you're experiencing through things like journaling so that you can advocate Mm -hmm. and can recognize I'm having a, a fear response here. I am becoming defensive and I'm, I've stopped listening. Right. At which point you could say that to your partner and say, and you have done, you have said that to me. <laughs> you said, okay, uh, you know, stuff is coming up and I need to just take a break. Right. And that's so helpful because, you know, otherwise you're, you're trying to communicate about something that is emotionally charged to an emotionally charged defensive person who's having a fear response. It's right. not gonna go well. Right, right, exactly. Right? Which brings up another point here. And I think, I think, I don't know, maybe help me out with the, you're so much more eloquent than I am. So help me out with this. Be prepared when you're presenting your stories uh, for, a myriad responses, mm -hmm. right? So be prepared for, you know, you might get resistance in other words, um, or you might get somebody who shuts down 
um, because that's their coping mechanism when when distress comes up is they just mm -hmm. immediately shut down and they don't know how to react um so it's really important to have the clarity around your intentions when you're presenting this information and you're trying to work on these challenges whatever they may be um and then also you know like you said earlier do you have the time for this right you know, do you have the space right. for this? You said that to me. If I had, if if you, I would say yes, even if I didn't, because of curiosity alone. <laughs> I mean, I I wouldn't be able to to wait. Like that's just who I am. Um, right. But I have said before, I have a massive headache, or I'm super tired, or you know, I right. can't right now. Right. Right. It's frustrating right. to hear that though from your partner. It is. It it takes <laughs> me aback every single time you do that. I'm like, oh, yeah. uh, okay, and I have to like this split second sort of. Oh, okay. Well, fine then. And then, you know, but it goes away quickly. I mean, I'm getting used to it now, but that's because I don't expect it. I don't ever think about it. And, you know, I'm working on that. I'm working on trying to, you know, I'll, I'll ask you, Hey, do you want to see this? Or, Hey, do you have time to look at this or whatever? And then I'll show you one little thing. And then that one little thing I get excited about, and it turns into this big thing and kudos to you for stopping me and saying, you know what, I can't do this anymore right now. Mm -hmm. But I still have that reaction, that that gut reaction of, well, fuck you then, right? You know? <laughs> kind of comes up for me sometimes, right? But yes, then I remember, oh, no, she's advocating for herself and her boundaries and her needs, yeah. and I want to respect those, yeah. right? And so then I just, you know, I just I say, okay, absolutely, let me know when you're ready, right? Or we revisit it the next day or or whatever the case is, right? So I think it's important that we we understand that there's a potential that somebody isn't going to react the way we hope they will. And mm -hmm. if they don't, or if they make a, a request that's reasonable and it's advocating for the boundaries that we honor that, even if we want to go knee deep into the hoopla right away. <laughs> I love that knee deep into the hoopla. I think that's your next book. It's a great, it's a, oh, I can't do it because it's already a name of an album by Jefferson, oh. <laughs> Jefferson Starship, knee deep oh. in the hoopla. Yeah. You know, that's that's really great that you brought that up because boundaries are the first step to coming together and figuring out sort of where where you are misaligned and what you do need from your partner and what you can do about your relationship. So for example, if you came to me and said we're, we're not spending enough time together, which you would never do, but you know, let's live a little in this fantasy world. Okay, so <laughs> Greg says, is there something that we need to unpack here <laughs> huh? later i don't have the bandwidth right now um, <laughs> okay robot girl <laughs> so say you said that to me uh and i know that i have certain limitations right with my recovery from concussion and whatnot that i you know would have to kind of re-look at the schedule and carve out some time Car like actually do the work to carve out some time, right? But I also need to not put your need to spend more time together above my need for recovery, right? So there's that, we're not misaligned. We just have to find the common ground where we can meet, right? So evenings are better for me after I've had a nap, great. That's a perfect time for us to come together, spend more time together, have some quality time, some cuddle time, some FaceTime, play a game, do something fun and silly, bake together, whatever we want to do. Um, before that, not so great because I haven't rested yet. Right? Your, your boundaries might not necessarily be around your physical capabilities, right? No. You're talking you're talking Anything. about physical capabilities, right? You're talking about your ability because of, of you know, your concussion recovery and all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's important to know because I don't, I'm not challenged with those physical attributes, but I am, I do find myself challenged um, on an emotional level. Like I, I literally, my tank gets full and I realize I can't process anything anymore. So you I mean think, it gets empty? Uh, yeah, sorry, it gets empty and I'm no longer able to process anything anymore. And so I, I start to feel overwhelmed and I start to feel like I don't have any more energy to process things. And it has absolutely nothing to do with my physical well-being because I'm in, I'm in really good shape. It has everything to do with my emotional well-being as a highly sensitive person. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to understand that boundaries aren't just about your physical capabilities. Like you don't have 
the time no. where you don't have the, the physical energy to do it. But it's really important to understand that when it comes to emotional capacity, these things apply as well. And I really Absolutely. want to get that message out to people because I don't want people, because too often we realize, you know what, I can't have a conversation with you right now. And then, so you make up some bullshit story about the fact that your leg hurts or you need to poop or you need to do whatever, right? The reality <laughs> is that sometimes you can't have the conversation with somebody because you're just not emotionally capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to normalize that. Yes. Yes. And then also address it if it continues. So if your partner uh, is responding to your request to, you know, explore this with you and their response is, I can't do this right now. And it continues that way. Mm -hmm. Then I think, you know, it's, what's happening is the overwhelm or the, the lack of fuel in the tank or whatever is chronic. And that could be yeah. actually a real foundational issue in the relationship, right? And more importantly, you think it can be a foundational really issue within the individual. Sure. Because going back to that piece about individual work and-, and The pillars. And, right, the pillars, right? You know, you've got one pillar that is incapable of emotionally, of, of, of handling emotionally challenging or difficult situations. Mm -hmm. So then you can do all as the other pillar, you can do all you want to try to help support that person. But the, at the end of the day, they have to be willing to do the work. Yes. Right. And if they're not willing to do the work and they, and you keep going back to the same well and saying, Hey, I want to have these conversations with you and they keep putting you off. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a bit of a red flag for both of you, because then it's like, okay, I'm not able to have this conversation. I can't do this. Right. And, and it's then clearly you're... something, it's clearly something that matters to you, my partner. Right. So right. Exactly. Um, I need to do the work in order to get myself in a place where I can have these conversations. Right. Right. If I want to stay invested in the relationship. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So I think it's really, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a key actually, I think is that idea that it's, it's, it's about connectedness, but it's also about separateness. So one of the things that, that can come up as a rut is uh, intimacy, right? Where you haven't explored, experimented, tried anything to connect, to be intimate with your partner, to um, bring each other closer. That, that's what intimacy is really about. Authentic intimacy is about showing up as you are, but also being present for your partner. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people miss that piece. And so they assume, uh, you know, they're getting enough intimacy if, or their partner's getting enough intimacy if their partner is, you know, being told I love you and being hugged on a regular basis. And there's, you know, a sexual element if they are participating as sexual partners. Um, there's a romantic element if, you know, but it's about being present. It, so you can do all these things and not be present. Right. Right. So what does that feel like? What does that look like? When your partner's not present, you, it doesn't matter what intimacy is happening. You still feel the disconnect mm -hmm. because they're not thinking about what they're experiencing in the moment. They're not thinking about the connection that they're building with you. Uh, their mind is a thousand other places. They're uh, not responding to the, the stimuli that's happening right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it could be something like, you know, you're in the middle of a cuddle and you can tell that, that they're still tense or they're still, you know, um, unable or unwilling to really uh, relax, reciprocate, and relax, relax, right? Relax and reciprocate. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, my word for 2020 is presence, right? Um, yes. Not, not, a, not as in the kind that you get or give. You mean 2021? 2021. Yeah. Sorry. It, it is 2021, isn't it? I know. Um, yeah, crazy. Um, I have definitely been um, 
uh, been lacking in that department in some some relationships uh, and intimacy overall honestly is can be challenging for me sometimes um, even between you and I it can be challenging mm -hmm. so I find that you know like we're doing these these you know five ten minute cuddle things which are really helping me um, stop everything like you know put everything away no phones lights are off dogs are in the other room there's no distractions and we literally just lay there and set a timer for five minutes and it really it's 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 meditative in a way mm -hmm. right because and i mean we're talking or whatever but it's not about that it's just about being connected right um i mean that's just one example um uh, of being present but also being present like even now when we're talking about this stuff you know i find some uncomfortableness coming up to the point to where i want to joke about it a little bit oh yeah so so i think intimacy is an area that i need to work on and in mm -hmm. intimacy is an area that i need to become more present in for sure absolutely there's a lot of work that i'd like to do around that um but having said that i also feel like relationship wise i can come to you and i can say hey I want to try this or I want to explore this or I want to experiment with this that or the other and there's a there's a safe space for exploration there right right you know or or you're going to be honest with me and say that's just not something that I'm interested in so let's investigate alternatives right mm -hmm. whatever those alternatives might look like so I guess ultimately what I'm saying what am I saying ultimately what I'm saying here is is that um being present is so overlooked and it's not, it, and it's the, it's, it's the weirdest fucking thing because you're not aware of it until you are aware of it. <laughs> until you're present. <laughs> right. Until you're present. Because I mean, for me, I wasn't aware. I thought I was being present, but nope. Turns out I wasn't not, not at least not immersively present anyway. Mm -hmm. But once I really started to look into the idea of presence through meditation and really getting in touch with my, my body and who I was and, and, you know, exercise like i don't know for those of you out there that listen and, and you you do intense exercise there's nothing else in your system that's distracting you from trying to do what you're doing in those moments mm -hmm. that's the very definition of being present absolutely so, so then take that and apply that to other areas of your life mm -hmm. right to, to to intimacy right the very definition of that right well, and I think, you know, with a fearful avoidant person, it's probably one of the hardest places for you to feel present. Yeah, I, I'm getting uncomfortable as we're talking about it. <laughs> okay. I am. I'm All literally right. getting uncomfortable. But that's I'm fine. So I don't mind. I don't mind the uncomfortable. Um, yeah. I don't mind doing it. I don't mind unpacking that. I don't mind being transparent and vulnerable about that. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's interesting to me because for so long in my life, I shut down and I shut it down. And I think that's part of the reason that that my relationships didn't last is because mm -hmm. I wasn't able to be present. I wasn't able to be there, like intimately be there. Well, and there's lots of ways that not being present shows up with, that look OK, like I deflect with humor. Right. That's a way of not being present. Mm -hmm. And it looks OK from the outside because it looks like I'm jovial, I'm engaging, I'm communicating cating with my partner i'm i'm you know uh making them laugh we're sharing this moment it looks connecting but it's not because what i'm doing is stepping right outside of whatever uncomfortable emotion i was having <laughs> in right. order to not have it right i mean yeah. full transparency uh you know we we started talking about intimacy i made a joke and then we edited it out so you're not going to see the joke but the point of editing out was because I recognized that what I was doing was I was, instead of sitting in the uncomfortableness, I was trying to get out of it. And that's mm -hmm. because of this idea that I don't want, or I, I resist. It's not that I don't want it. I resist mm -hmm. intimacy. Um, right, right. Because, I mean, I remember as a child, I hated being hugged. And I still don't really, I'm not 100% on board with it, <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, I enjoy it immensely with certain people uh, and I'm a hugger with people, which is weird, but I'm not really there if that makes any sense sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I mean. You can, you can go through these motions that look like connectivity and have no presence. Right. And, 
that can be a coping mechanism like what you're talking about. Right. And how, how many times has this ever happened to you where you meet somebody that is all about being present and it freaks you the fuck out? Oh, totally. Oh, gosh. I dated a Buddhist. I couldn't handle it. <laughs> I was like, what right? is happening? <laughs> right? Like, I mean, for me, it was intimidating. But it's kind of the ideal. That's kind of where I want to get to is this place of such presence and such awareness Right. I, I know we're digressing a little bit, but still it's like it's that it's 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 so beautiful to to witness, but it's also intimidating as fuck. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the things that we are going to kind of get to here to wrap this up is sort of okay, we've we've got a safe space, we've carved out some time, we've come with a willingness. We're curious about our partner's wants and needs. We're advocating for our own because we've articulated what they are to ourselves first, right? And we, we bring the conversation to them. Um, we have the conversation. What is the, what is the goal then? I mean, you know, where do we go from there, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got our boundaries in place. We know what they are. Uh, you know, we kind of know how long we, we are willing to continue to invest in this sort of internally. We, we've got an idea of where we are in the world and in this relationship. And so we're having this great conversation. Now what? <laughs> right. Next step. Well, I think the next steps are action. Taking action. Yes. Um, Taking action. Agree, making agreements and saying, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. So an example could be, um, if intimacy is uh, is something that's that's challenging in your relationship, you could say, okay, so you know, an example is, you know, every other day for five minutes, we're gonna lay down and we're gonna snuggle, um, mm -hmm. or um, it could be something as simple as when you hug your partner, you give a full embrace hug and you count to thirty while you're doing mm -hmm. it, right? So the key though is is that it's got to be actionable things, things that. Right. The other person can witness and can see, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that's the next logical step, in my opinion. And that's on I top think, of on top, on top of, of doing our own work, right? Exactly on top of doing your own work, of, of course. Uh, but my, I always tell my clients in terms of you know what's the next step is well the next step is taking action is actually doing something. So mm -hmm. it, it, it depends on what the breakdown or the disconnect or the fracture in the relationship is. Is, is mm -hmm. to what you do, but you and your partner or partners will will agree and say, okay, so this is the plan moving forward. This is what we're going to do and whatever that looks like. Yeah. Right. And then you do that for a time with regular check-ins. Okay. How's this working for you? Is this, you know, are you feeling so a week later or two weeks later or whatever you check in again? Okay. So we've done this. Um, I'm feeling X, Y, and Z. What are you feeling? Well, if you're feeling X, Y, and Z too, great. Then we continue down this road. Right. If you're not feeling X, Y, or Z, or if you're feeling Y but not Z, then oh, Z. Sorry for Canadians. Um, <laughs> but if you're if you're not feeling those things, then you reevaluate, renegotiate, and then you move forward again with a plan. The idea here too is that um, you know we are designers of our relationships. Mm -hmm. Our relationships belong to the people involved in them. And they can look any way we want, right? And so um, if there is an intimacy issue where there's some, you know, uh, somebody has a higher libido, for example, you can address that by showing up for your partner who has the higher libido and, and giving them the opportunity to experience, you know, an orgasm or, or sexual play without being concerned for whether you do or not right so um that's a, a great way to address an inequity in terms of libido and i feel like a lot of people are very hooked on the idea of you know we have to have sex this many times per month for it to be a healthy relationship and if we're not having that it's not healthy or they don't desire me anymore or i'm undesirable you know and so we can we can we can design our relationship to look however it works for us, mm -hmm. right? right? I think that's a really important thing for people to remember is that it 
it doesn't have to look like everybody else's. And, you know, maybe in, for example, poly relationships, people step outside the relationship to get other needs met, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's perfectly, you know, wonderful. If everybody's on board and consensual, awesome. Right. Right. right? And I think, I think, need, go ahead. I think when we use language like step outside, I don't, you know, I, I, that, that to me anyway, that implies non-consent. So hmm. you know, just being, being clear oh, yeah. that, no, it no, is, no. that it is all consensual and transparent and, and ethical and stuff. Everybody needs to be aware for sure. Right. And on exactly. board. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I think that designer piece is really important and that our relationships are just as unique as we are as individuals. Mm -hmm. Every relationship isn't going to have a sexual component to it, right? Some people decide to become incredibly close parenting partners who live together and who don't engage in sexual relations with each other. Right. You know, um, I've seen that work before and I, I think it's a, an amazing thing if you can pull it off <laughs> mm -hmm. and great for the kids because there's stability, right? Um, and I, I just want to mention the, the kids piece too, because as a person who left an unhealthy relationship during a time when my child was quite young, that was really hard as a decision to make. And I know a lot of people stay in relationships because of children. And sometimes that makes sense. And sometimes it makes sense for a time. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. So you really have to individually evaluate what are the pros and cons here? And what is my child witnessing in the day-to-day -day interactions that I'm having in my home with my right. partner? And would that be easier for them if we were not together? One of the things that I discovered as a parent was that uh, when I did separate from my daughter's father, they were able to have a relationship that was separate from me that they'd never had before. Mm -hmm. And in some ways that was really hard. And in some ways that was really healthy. Right. And there were some real um, advantages to that for them especially as she grew older. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I remember that time as being, you know, fraught with a lot of worry about how things were going to turn out, but I recognized I couldn't stay in the situation I was in because the cons were outweighing the pros. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Well, you know, I, I work with a few clients that have kids and they are navigating some pretty, uh, difficult long-term relationships mm -hmm. and trying to figure out, you know, what is this scenario that would, would kind of be the straw that breaks the camel's back kind of thing. Where do I draw the line? Where are my boundaries? Right. And so it's, it's challenging for sure. There are other reasons why people stay in relationships, like for their own safety if they feel unsafe leaving, that's when you definitely need help. You definitely need an exit strategy and you definitely need professionals. Right. So you reach out to a local shelter or a local support group and yeah. get those things in place. And if you find that's, that's something else and too, is, is if you find yourself in a physically or emotionally abusive situation and you do need that help, please reach out to your local resources for it. Please, 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 mm -hmm. please. Speaking from the, from as a cis male, I'm going to speak from from my personal experience when it comes to sexual um, pleasure and intimacy. For so many years, I thought that having sex meant orgasming. Mm -hmm. That was the end result, quote unquote, for sex. Was that I, you know, if 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 I wasn't feeling it, um, you know, or if I didn't make my partner orgasm, or if I didn't orgasm, then it was, you know, it was a failure, right? And it's been in recent years when I started to re, re, reframe the experience as, as, a, as, a, as an experience of intimacy and connection. And it doesn't matter if anybody orgasms or not. 
right? Mm -hmm. It's just the experimenting and the exploring and, and, and all of that stuff. So if you can do, if you find yourself as a man, as a, as a male identifying person, if you find yourself feeling frustrated because either, you know, you don't feel like you're pleasing your partner or you, you know, you're, you're engaging in sexual activity, but it's not, you're not finding any level of, of satisfaction from it, then I encourage you to do some work around, you know, what, what are your values when it comes to intimacy and sex? I encourage you to really take a, take a look at, at why are you engaging in sex to begin with and really discovering mm -hmm. what the answers to those questions are. Because if you're engaging in sex for an end, for an end game, in this case, orgasm, um, that might not always happen. And every time it does happen or doesn't happen, um, I, I think you're setting yourself up for, um, for disappointment mm -hmm. and, and, and which can lead to frustration and, you know, can lead to a host of other challenges and issues down the road. So yeah. for me, what worked was reframing the experience as an experiment. You know, what happens if, instead of, I want this to happen, what happens if I step into this energy and, and experiment with it and see where it leads me? If there's, I, I will extend it out to anybody. If there's anything else that you guys want to hear us talk about or unpack more in depth, please feel free to reach out to, to us, leave it in the comments, um, reach out to us through our websites or whatever. We would be happy to, because I know this is such a, there's, there's so many, this is such a complex topic and there's so many different things and so many different experiences that people are having out there. So if there's anything specific that you want us to talk about or you want us to investigate or help you with even, please feel free to reach out to us. Absolutely. And remember, choose love and keep it kind. <laughs>